I always, I would, I would be thinking about you right now. What's up, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, Ken O.K. Howard, and I'm back again with another episode of How You Doing? I know it's been a while since I came to you all with an episode and a guest, but today I have a very special guest with me, um, uh, another one of my professors that I had at UK because I've been taking some interesting classes. I've been here at school, and I was like, why not? Let me talk to some of these professors and get to know them about the career because they are so interesting. And this one, he, he's just as interesting as the rest of them. This is David Stevenson I have with me today. Uh, David is a freelance uh, photojournalist and an assistant professor at the University of Kentucky School of Journalism and Media. He started teaching full-time in UK in 2014. Uh, he is a four-time recipient of the Kentucky News Photographers Association Photographer of the Year Award and has been named Sports Photographer of the Year three times. He won the National Press Photographers Association Region 4 Photographer of the Year twice. David, how's it going? Kendall, it is going great. Thank you for having me. I very much appreciate it. I'm honored that you asked me to join you. I was like, I'm going to be on Kendall's show. He finally asked me. What, what it was going to so happen long? eventually. <laughs> Y'all, you know I was going to have you on there eventually. Eventually, so. yeah. You got to work your way down to David. <laughs> no, 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 no. Got to work my way up. Got to work my way up. <laughs> Who okay. we got left? Who's left? Uh, David, David down there. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> But but for real, uh, David. So talk to us. Like, what made you like? Obviously, you're an, a very accredited photographer with these awards, and there's plenty of other things that I probably haven't even listed. Like, tell me, like, what made you get into photography in the first place? Like, oh, what, boy. what made you get into this field? That's a long story, man. Because I'm an old person, so you got to go way back. Um, <laughs> I mean, so photojournalism kind of came by accident um it really started as as um just wanting to take pictures frankly so i i i found a picture of me that my mother took um i was probably three years old and i had a camera in my hand so i've had cameras in my hands for a very very long time i remember as a very young person six or eight years old finding um a, a, what i considered a real camera that was my mother's so my mother and father had uh, a lot of influence on me because they dabbled in photography as well and they had a lot of their gear and darkroom stuff um, in closets. And I found those things and started messing with them when I was a kid. And I was, I was just out in the neighborhood taking pictures of my friends and of just things um, and wildlife too, birds. You know, I have a, a strong connection with uh, wildlife and birds. Um, we might talk about that a little bit. We will. But um, it just started when I was young. And then I think it was in high school. Uh, and this is true for a lot of people. This is a fairly common story that um, in high school, the outlets for photography are pretty slim, but one of the big ones was the high school newspaper and yearbook. So I grew up in Lexington, um, taking pictures around my neighborhood in Lexington, but we moved to Berea when I was in high school age, my family did. And so I went to high school in Berea, the Berea Community School, and uh, thankfully they had uh, a newspaper with a great advisor and they had a yearbook with also a great advisor. So that gave me my outlet to continue to take pictures and kind of have a purpose with my pictures, having things to take pictures of, gave me a little, a little, bit, a little bit of authority to have that press badge on and gave me access to things, you know, and I'm the kind of person and, and um, you, a lot of photographers, a lot of photojournalists and documentary style photographers um, consider themselves to be observers. And that was the kind of person I was as a young kid. I was fairly shy and I, I like to watch things as they happen, but I didn't necessarily want to participate in things. And that's what the camera I found. Um, and I didn't really think about this until much later in life, but I think that that's what was going on is that the, in high school, the camera allowed me to participate in things, but not necessarily be active participant in those things. I could go to them, I could hang out um, and be there with everybody, but I didn't have to be front and center. So I, I think I'm in my nature is to be a quiet observer. Uh, and so the photography and photojournalism really worked well with that personality. Uh, then I started working in high school 
also with the local newspaper. And so they uh, allowed me to shoot assignments for them and I started making a little bit of money. And then I discovered um, that when I started thinking about college and trying to decide where to go, uh, I discovered that Western Kentucky University just across the state has a fantastic journalism program. In fact, my yearbook advisor at, at my high school was a graduate of that program and she turned me onto that program. And then, so I, I inquired at Western, I was thinking about it. And then Western actually started, one of the professors there started recruiting me, to, uh, two professors there started recruiting me as a photojournalism student. And uh, they told me later that they'd never done that before. Uh, never actually had that or felt like they wanted to actively recruit anybody. So I thought that was fairly flattering. I didn't, I'm glad they didn't tell me that at the time, uh, but they told me that much later. Um, but I really didn't know much about journalism all I th all I knew was that the the journalism was a was a mechanism for me to take pictures. That's all I really wanted was to take pictures. And then I found like, oh, I can make a little money taking pictures. Mm -hmm. Oh, you give me twenty five bucks for like that whole week where I shot a bunch of pictures for you. That's cool. Okay, I'll so do you, that again. So you was taking pictures in high school for a newspaper, and you wasn't getting paid at all. Not at, well, not at the high school level, but when I started working for the local paper, yeah, they mm -hmm. started paying me. And then I was like, oh, this is real. Like, yeah, I didn't know I could make money. At the, I didn't know this is this could be a career. You mean like I was just taking pictures because I just love taking pictures. And now I'm like, oh, you're talking about a career. And it's really interesting to me to think about photographers who like to take pictures and then photojournalists because I think they're two different things. Mm, photo journal about that. Photojournalists are, are taking pictures uh, for a purpose, really. Photographers, and and I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of photojournalists out there I know that stumbled into newspaper jobs because they just like to take pictures. And they weren't really truly storytellers. They just were happy to be making a living taking pictures. And I was too. And I kind of had to develop into the storyteller part through college and through my internships and early on in my career. Because at first, yeah, this was just a way for me to figure out how to like take something I loved, a passion, and be able to make a living out of it. Mm -hmm. I thought about going to school. Roche I, I, I applied for school at the Rochester Institute of Technology. They had a photo program. I applied and uh, visited uh, Pratt Arts Pratt Art Institute in New York because they had a photo program. Um, I actually went and and almost no, I did apply. I did. I, I can't remember. I guess I looked. I don't think I actually applied, but I I almost went to college for ornithology. Speaking of birds, mm. uh, so that was how close my career trajectory could have changed. Is uh, that I had a, a love of birds and took ornithology classes in high school at the college level. And uh, I gave it some serious thought, and Cornell was kind of the place to do that. Um, I don't think I applied for it, though, but, I, boy, I almost did. Um, You'd have been down with Andy Bernard. Yeah. Who, I mean, <laughs> who knows where I'd be right now? Um, so, so, you know, the, the journalism part, I think I just kind of lucked into it, the storytelling part, uh, frankly. And that came through, um, through my classes and my professors at Western and my internships. Well, so what was, like – the first, what was like the first one when you realized that you made, you were starting to make a transition from a photographer to a photojournalist that you started to realize like, man, I'm liking not only just the photo itself, but the storytelling aspect of it. Like what, what was that moment that made you click and like start to transition into a photojournalist? Well, that's a great question. That's a very hard question. I think it happened slowly, frankly. I don't mm -hmm. think there was one moment. I think it started in college, but even in college, I was just, I was just fired up to be taking pictures, to be taking news pictures. I was very, well, some people probably say I'm still very competitive. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I want to take the best pictures. I want to be the best photojournalist that I can be. Ain't nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with that. And, and in college, it's very competitive because you're competing against your classmates for grades. You're competing against your classmates for internships mm -hmm. and then jobs in the end because you got to, you know, then there's all the college uh, awards that you can be doing. And so I was so focused on my classes and the assignments and trying to figure out how to get those best pictures. that I think I wasn't completely, totally focused on storytelling so much. I mean, they were teaching that to us and I was executing it, but I think I was just doing it because that's what I felt like I had to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was good fun and all. Um, but I think that that evolution really happened over a longer period of time when I realized that I had much more power and much more um, 
influence, I guess, when I took better storytelling photos, as opposed to just going out and um, just executing that job and coming back um, and finishing it up and leaving for the day. Yeah. So would you say you like being a photographer better or a photojournalist better? Uh, photojournalist, um, much, much better for, for the reason that I, that I said that, that, that you, when a photojournalist does their job well, they can have much more influence mm -hmm. on people and, and evoke reactions from people um, and inform people and entertain people even. We do a lot of things. We're very, very diverse uh, kind of people. What I love the most about photojournalism, as opposed to just being, yeah. but you can make a living in photography in a lot of different ways, a right. lot of different ways. Wedding photographer, portrait photographer, uh, commercial photographer. I mean, you name it. Birth but photographer. Me. Yeah. Funeral, funeral photographer. Oh yeah. <laughs> like we talked about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a lot of ways that you can make a living with cameras. Um, and some of them pay very, very well, frankly. The commercial photographers pay great, great money. Fashion photographers make great money if you can get mm -hmm. in there. But to me, the photojournalism part was um, much more about humanity. And it allowed me, you know, the, re the reward to me was I never had an office job, never, as a photojournalist, because you didn't, you could not do your job from an office. You had to be out in the field. So every day I would come in in the morning and I would get my two or three assignments and they would be who knows where in the city or in the state. And when I was with the Herald Leader, we covered an awful lot of things in the state, which was my favorite things to do. And I would just be out exploring. And of course, the people and things that I was photographing were interesting or we wouldn't be doing stories about them. So I got to meet fantastic people in some interesting places. The things that I got to do as a photojournalist were amazing. Yeah. I mean, I've been, I've been, on the top of the Capitol Rotunda on the outside. Who's got, who gets to do that? I've met, um, I've ridden in a helicopter with a Dalai Lama. I've had a portrait session, one-on-one -on -one portrait session with Harrison Ford. I had breakfast with John Cleese. I've one-on-one uh, -on -one stuff. I mean, ridden in an so, elevator with Gene Simmons. I mean, so that's, I kind of like leads into my next question. I was actually gonna get into it like, what are like some of your favorite stories or like moments that you got to cover over the years of being a photographer and or a photojournalist? Like you already listed out like some amazing accomplishments and things that people never even get a chance to do. Like what are some of your favorites in your career? Um, oh gosh, they, they're the, the highlights, you know, you tend, like I just did, you tend to highlight the celebrity stuff because people, people react to that. They're like, what? Harrison Ford. That's cool, man. Tell me yeah. about that. So they make good stories. Uh, and that was fun. That, that day with Harrison Ford made a fantastic story and it always will. Uh, but I also cherish the times where I meet strangers who have no business being in the paper other than maybe I stumbled upon them and we find a reason to get them in the paper. Uh, and I, and we did a, a series called Project Dateline at the Herald Leader that was one of my all-time favorite things to do. And it was really about nothing. But we found a mechanism to go out into the community and tell stories of, of just normal people. What we did was we, we would pick a name of a place. We'd get, a, we'd get on the Atlas, the Kentucky Atlas, and we would scour the state and find the strangest named places. And we'd go, okay, boom, you know there that's where we're going to go next week and the reporter and I would get up at the butt crack of dawn and we'd be there early when the light was good and we would just find what, whatever we found we'd knock on doors we'd find a farmer in the field we'd find somebody raking the grass or sweeping their porch and we would just make a story out of it and it was the most pure thing and I loved it and still love it um, but th they weren't celebrities um, they weren't criminals they were just people and I love that um, but some of the other things, I mean, I've seen, you know, the, I tell all new photographers or people who are interested in photojournalism that the, the camera is like a, the golden ticket um, and the press pass is the golden ticket. You get, we are, we are, we are you know, the first witnesses to history. Um, we are the documentarians of these important things that are happening. Uh, it could be anything from a basketball game, a championship game. We talked about Michigan State, you know, UK today, I think, in class. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, Tom I got Izzo to see, and Chuck Hayes picture. Yeah, yeah the picture of, of Chuck Hayes and Tom, Tom Izzo. 
you know, documenting that moment. I'm, I'm so glad I, I was there to be able to witness that and to document that moment that was really special to um, uh, a small group of people that were players, but then a larger group of people, the fans as well. I mean, even you guys uh, in the class today, when we talked about that, knew that moment, knew of that game. And that was a long time ago. I, I didn't know because I'm a Wolves <laughs> fan, but the other classmates knew. <laughs> yeah, they knew about it. And yeah. I don't know when that was. They knew all the details. And I'm yeah. pretty sure they didn't watch that game live. They might have, but they would have been. I mean, they would have been 10 years old or something, yeah. eight years old. So, you know, being, being – and then the older I get, the more I've realized that these things that I've seen have a lasting impact um, in, in their historical in nature. And as we talk some more, I'll think about some more to tell you about. But, but ser seriously, the, the photographers have the best jobs because we have to be there. We have to be in the front of everything – um, to see it happen and to photograph it happening. And, it, and that can include the bad stuff too, I'm afraid to say. Because yeah. news, news, <laughs> news can be terrible. You know, it can be floods. It can be murders. It can be violent crimes. Um, it can be crim I can't tell you how many perp walks I've had to photograph. I don't, and I've had to photograph funerals. It is the thing I hate to photograph the most. Anytime you tell me to go photograph a funeral, I just want to take the day off. It is the worst thing that we could possibly do, I think, but it is something that we've always done. And I never understood why we did it, but we would cover funerals. And it was famous people typically, mm -hmm. but still nobody wants us there at a funeral. I mean, it just drove me crazy uh, to have to do that. And I hated it with everything in me to have to go do that kind of thing. So just going off of that, um, have, have there been moments where you almost just kind of like, just said like effing like you didn't want to do it like it there was like a it was like a time where you just like question your ethics like you said you when you was told or asked to go shoot funerals you just was not in the mood for it like how many times in your career or were there just certain moments where you almost just like i'm not going to do this where you just question yourself like am i doing the right thing like should i take this picture like t talk to me about that there's been a lot of times when I have to question myself whether or not I should take this picture or take that picture. Um, and you have to make a, a, a judgment call on the fly what the news value is of that moment. And sometimes you don't know what the news value is until later. And so you we're trained to take the picture first and then you think about it later. Mm -hmm. But then the other times where you just have to make an assessment right there and you go, <laughs> this this doesn't have news value. It's not going to be something and it's going to cause more problems than not for me to take this picture and you just turn around and walk away. Um, I have one thing that happened to me really early in my career that was horrible. And I blame this, this newspaper for doing this to me and I didn't know any better, but, and it might be why I hate funerals. Now that I think about it, mm -hmm. um, I was applying for my first job. Uh, and I, I had, I had uh, graduated from Western and I took an internship at the Herald Leader the summer after I graduated. And during that internship, I was looking for a job. And this was in the early 1990s. And I got a, uh, applied for a job at, the, at a newspaper in Connecticut. And I'd never heard of the place, but you know, it was a job. And a uh, daily newspaper, it was like 70,000 circulation for photographers or something like that. And so they took me up there, they brought me up there to interview for the job. And part of the interview process was to give me some photo assignments. And they wanted to see what I could do with these assignments. These guys, the day before I got there, well, maybe the week before I got there, there was a local story where a, uh, there was a tragic uh, drinking and driving accident. And in, the, and in that accident was a young teenager who'd been on a motorbike and he'd taken up with some motor, uh, motorcycle guys and they'd been drinking and he somehow crashed and he died. So there's this one teenager who died. Well, they sent me out to cover the funeral of this kid who had died um, in a drinking accident. And I knew nothing about the city, knew nothing about the story. I was not connected to the town, um, had no authority of any kind or background. And they sent me to this funeral and uh, a graveside funeral, even at that. And I was out there, you know, and I dressed appropriately and I had my cameras and these motorcycle dudes came up to me and they saddled up next to me and they basically said, we don't want you here. And, uh, and I said, okay, I kind of get that. Um, but you know, it's kind of, kind of doing my job and I, you know, I'm like 21 or something. I don't know, 22 and, uh, trying to calm them down. And, uh, but at the same time, I'm like, man, I'm told to get out here and do this assignment. And, what if I come back with nothing and they're not going to hire me? And 
they're going to think I'm terrible at my job. And I was really trying to talk to these people, talk them into letting me like document this and, and, you know, give this kid a voice in a sense is what I was trying to let, tell them to do. Um, and they basically said, if we see that you've published a picture, we're going to come find you and hunt you down. Wow. <laughs> so I stuck around a little bit longer and then I left and I don't, I didn't take any pictures of course. And, uh, I don't remember what happened after that, but then I, but that was like, you know, the, they shouldn't have sent me to that. Yeah. It was a terrible thing for them to do. To Especially like, that. Your, that was your first assignment too? Yeah. Your very yeah. first assignment. But, All, yeah. but it was like a job interview assignment mm -hmm. in a place I'd never been before and didn't know anything about this stuff. I, I'm, I'm still mad at them for that. And that's probably why I hate funerals now, now that I think about it. But I just don't think, unless you're invited you know, or have permission to be at a funeral. And there are some cases like we talked about today that those are, those are relevant um, mm -hmm. to go cover. Um, but yeah, there's other times when, um, and it's usually during those really tragic times when you say, oh, what am I doing? How am I, why am I here? What am I doing this for? But the older I got and the more experience that I got, the editors trusted me um, and I could make those judgment calls on the fly and they, they would be okay with that. But that took a long time for me to gain the confidence to know when I was right and be able to justify that and for my editors to trust me that I was gonna be right uh, and, and be able to just walk away from something and say, we shouldn't be there or it's just not here or something like that. And yeah. there were times early on in my career too where I just wasn't sure this is what I wanted to do because we, look, we teach, my professors taught me and I'm sure I'm teaching you guys um, the, the uh, the ideal, you know, the best we could possibly be, like the stuff that we're talking about in our class right now. The the reality of you being able to uh, to be given the time and to produce a story like that, say at a local television station, is pretty slim. Mm -hmm. um, and when we go out there in the real world and are faced with the realities of tight deadlines and limited um, limited um, um, resources, try, trying to think of the word there, tight deadlines, limited resources, and uh, some editors that are, that just care more about um, volume than they do quality, you know, that kind of hits you hard. Like you got to find a place that cares as much as you do. Mm -hmm. um, and there are times where I've, I've worked at places. I did get that job in Connecticut. They hired me and it was the worst job I ever had. <laughs> Did you have should, more assignments like that? I should have known it. Yeah, I did. Oh, and man. They, they were terrible. And, you know, I, I came in there like, like a, you know, like a hot stallion out, out of the gate. And, and like, I know like a photojournalist, I got a degree and I've been all these internships and these awards coming out of school. And these he people was, were like, was just, ready. I, I was ready to go. And they sent me, they sent me to this one assignment. <laughs> on a Saturday night, I got the weekend shift because I'm the new guy. Mm -hmm. And on a Saturday night, and they sent me to this, uh, it was like this art gallery opening or something. And I worked that thing so hard. I was like pulling every, every trick out of my bag. I was using like silhouettes and composition and layering and making these beautiful pictures. And I came back with like eight or 10, this is back in the film day too. Came back with, you know, eight or 10 pictures that they wanted. My editor looked at me and goes, what, what is, what is this stuff? I'm like, you told me to go do this gallery thing. I mean, I shot these great pictures. That's as good as I could do. Are they not good enough? Cause I'm thinking I couldn't have done any better because mm -hmm. it was just people standing around with drinks and stuff and looking at walls. Well, it turns out this was a society column and they wanted me to just go take pictures of people like holding their martinis and looking in the camera and smiling. Mm. Did so they tell you that beforehand? They didn't tell me that. Oh, they assumed gosh. I knew what this was because they had some, you know, gallery thing, Saturday night gallery thing. I'm like, I didn't know what this thing was. And so they're like, this, so this is what you want me to do? You want me to go take pictures of people like staring at the camera drinking? Mm. I mean, that's not what I signed up for. And it took, you know, I, I, I found another job in like 11 months and I went out to uh, um, uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming was my second job. So it could complete reversal. I was making pretty good money in Connecticut, but the job sucked and uh, went to Wyoming and the job was fantastic, but the money sucked. Yeah. Uh, but God, it's beautiful out there. And I learned so much out there. It was a weekly paper. I did everything at that paper. I mean, took pictures as a photo editor, I redesigned the paper and was doing, you know, digital 
you know, photo layouts and front page layouts. Uh, um, I delivered the paper. Um, one day we even had the, the machine broke and we had to manually insert stuff in the paper. The only thing I didn't do there was sell ads. Wrote stories. I mean, it was fantastic. Best job. You did everything. Did everything. And I recommend that for anybody to do everything in a job. And so, cause you, you know what, when you do, when you do somebody else's job, you're a lot less likely to criticize that person, mm -hmm. you know, because you know what it takes, you know what it takes to put inserts in those papers um, yeah. after you've done it once. You, you get to like feel and you actually get to walk in their shoes. Cause like, I know some people sometimes like you might criticize somebody like, Oh, they got it easy. Their job is easy. Once you actually step in those shoes <laughs> of like filling paper into that machine, you guys like, Oh yeah, this, this is yeah. harder than I thought. Yeah. You got a lot of respect for your coworkers once you start doing their jobs. Definitely. So talking on, like, I know you said, um, when we went to, at your first job in Connecticut, like you was unsure about going to that funeral site and taking that assignment and you eventually just turned away. Like, can you give like any advice to like any young photographers or photojournalists that, that, that could be put in a position and like, what can they do to be, I, I guess, better equipped and be ready to keep their, I guess, let me see, let me, let me look for the words for this. Like, just, just be better equipped for the situation if they go into something similar to what you went into or if they face with a challenge of questioning their own ethics. What's your advice mm -hmm. to them? Um, my advice to them would be to, to try to have some confidence in what you believe and, and kind of understand what you believe and where you stand on things. And also to be able to articulate that. I don't think I was very good at that, at articulating things again. And it comes from me being an observer and not much of a talker. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I was never practiced in trying to say what I meant or what I felt because um, nobody ever really asked. And so, again, it took a long time to learn how to articulate the way I felt about pictures or the way I felt about assignments. Um, so I think that for anybody in whatever career, I think that that's an important skill to where you can describe how you feel about something and be able to articulate an argument that is respectful and effective. So had I been able to say going into that job interview, I don't think it's really appropriate for you to be sending uh, somebody from out of town uh, to this particular assignment. Um, maybe there's something else I could do that could show you some of my skill set. I should have said that. I didn't know I could have said that or how to say that. Uh, so I think having some confidence and, and practicing those things and knowing where your own values are. But sometimes you, you got to be also careful about that, knowing that if your values don't mesh with that particular employer, you need to know that ahead of time so that you know how to, how to stand up to that uh, or to walk away from it might be where, where you, some, unfortunately, sometimes we don't have choices. You know, we don't have a lot of choices, but we're walking away from something maybe may mean that you don't have a job. Mm -hmm. And that could be, that could be a dire consequence because mm -hmm. you yeah. can just lose out on your whole entire job altogether. Yeah. So being, ar being, being articulate, I think in what you believe and in what you're trying to accomplish is pretty helpful. I've, I found that over, over the years, what I learned was that the best argument is going to win and knowing how to kind of play the game a little bit. And I'm not talking about being argumentative. I mean, be convincing. Mm. Uh, I had a lot of city editors that were assigning me things and they were only assigning me things just to fill the paper. They didn't give a crap what I was doing. They just knew they needed a picture for A1 or B1 or B3 or whatever. And they were just sending me out to go fill that task. Once I realized that they didn't care anything about what I was doing other than giving them a picture, I realized that I had more power than I thought. And what I would do is I would go find my own pictures that I thought had value to them. And I would give it to them for their B1 or their A1. And they were happy as a clam. They didn't so, even know what they want. They just wanted like, a picture. They just, they just need a picture. And yeah. So once I realized <laughs> that I, was, I, could, I could do my job and theirs at the same time instead of making them do something I thought was dumb. Um, and then I could tell them, you know, it'd be, you know, it'd probably be better if I did this other thing and I can still let you do your, you know, it'll be for B1, but I think this is better. And they're like, okay, if you think so. So, so another thing is something that you touched on today in class uh, that I want to get to and something you could like, just tell people about is persistency. I know with you being a photographer and a photojournalist, you've been able to take like just pictures of things and of people that usually you wouldn't get access to or be able to take pictures of. Like how important is persistency when, when it comes to 
being able to get in that right room or in that right position to take some of these pictures. Oh man, it is so important that having that kind of, I think, I think that most journalists, most great journalists have this level of tenacity that just doesn't let go. You know, they can't let go of an idea, can't let go of a thought and they will just hammer, hammer, hammer away until they get at it. And I think that the best photographers are like that too. And they have a vision for a particular picture that is hard to get to. Um, assuming it's worthwhile, you're going to spend a lot of time trying to get access to that picture. I can't tell you how many of my best pictures were really, frankly, easy to take. They're just at the most basic level. Get it in focus, you know, get your exposure right and be there. F8 and be there is the classic term. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but the old school term for photographers will say F8 and be there. And F8 is a, is a designation for uh, an aperture, which means that if you're shooting at F8 in your lens, everything is in focus. Mm -hmm. So they're basically saying, just show up. Just show up and have your settings right and everything's in focus. That's what matters more than anything, F8 and be there. Um, so taking the pictures are oftentimes the easy part. It's just the... Um, getting access and being there at the right time, that is incredibly difficult. And the more time you spend thinking about that and hammering away at that, then I think the more successful you're going to be at some of those more successful pictures, the more meaningful pictures, the more emotional and intimate pictures. Um, I will spend, I, I learned this a long time ago too, that if you are doing, um, um, let's see, I was thinking about natural disasters. Um, cause that's something we have to cover a lot that gets, that's fairly sensitive and, you know, people are at their worst at a mad natural disaster. Um, but I found that getting inside of people's houses made for the best pictures and the most meaningful pictures, uh, during a natural disaster. And so you basically had to approach people and explain what you wanted to do and then try to, you know, earn their trust so that you could hang out with them inside and outside of their house. Um, and then, you know, once you have that access, uh, you get far more interesting pictures that way, whether they're, you know, cleaning the water out of their basement or carrying boxes out or something like that. So it's another kind of real world example of, of, of trying to get access that way. So going off, like, I know you like, we're going off, like you're talking about covering national disasters. Uh, one that's going on right now is in California and Oregon with the wildfires. I'm yeah. seeing like a lot of pictures online. Uh, people posting uh some people posting from pictures from their phone or someone even taking out their old cameras and using film to take pictures but i want to more i want to focus more so on like this phones like what is your thoughts on the current evolution of just phone cameras and how more and more people are becoming photographers just with just with this just with their phones like what are your what are your thoughts on this because you do teach a mobile journalism yeah. class as well so yeah Gosh, you think you think about it. Um, I almost when I first started teaching mobile journalism, um, it felt a little <laughs> traitorous in a way to my industry and to my brothers and sisters of photojournalists because <laughs> you know photojournalism is in a tight spot right now. There are fewer photojournalists now than there were ten years ago. There are fewer staff positions. Mm -hmm. When I was at the Herald Leader on it as an intern in the early nineties, there were. 10 or 12 staff photographers. Now there's two maybe. Really? Yeah. I mean, so they've been devastated. They might have a video person now in addition to that. And the reason is because photography is easier now. Photography is easier in terms of, I'm not going to say photojournalism is easier now. Photography is easier now because we now have these devices that make things far easier to be able to take, you know, it's just in your pocket now. Whereas before we had to have camera bag, you know, <laughs> multiple lenses, camera bag. Uh, we had to have a dark room. Um, now we don't have dark, we don't need dark rooms and you don't even need a laptop, frankly, anymore. You can just use your iPad or your phone to do these things. So mm -hmm. I felt like I was turning on my industry when I start teaching writers how to take um, better pictures with their smartphones. But that's just the way, that's just where we are. I mean, we can't fight that. We can't, it's never going to go back. Um, my philosophy on taking pictures with phones is that I don't, I don't really care what device it is. And I say this to my mobile students all the time is that it's, it, the camera doesn't matter. It really doesn't. It's just, it's the stuff. It's the stuff that's behind your eyes that matters and between your ears that matters more than anything is what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that power that you've got in your pocket? That's what matters more than anything. 
And so what I try to teach them is, uh, you know, everybody's a photographer now. Um, everybody thinks they're a photographer now. How do we separate ourselves as journalists uh, from that group of people? You know, if we're in a, if we're in a stadium and there's 20,000 people, there's 20,000 photographers there. How do we do better than that? Well, we can, we can apply some fundamentals such as composition and light and changing perspective. And we can think about, um, you know, layering techniques or uh, moments, you know, goodness, let's talk about moments and trying to capture these really important moments in people's lives. But the number one thing that I tell them above all else is to be somewhere important with your camera. That's really what matters is be in front of something that's relevant, be in front of something interesting and your pictures are going to be more interesting and they're going to be more relevant uh, no matter the technical um, side of it. So yeah, it's tough. Um, photos on, on one hand, um, um, the photojournalists uh, are having a rougher time of it. Uh, on the other hand, photos are more valuable now than they have ever been. You think about social media feeds, uh, All I see is pictures. They're beasts. They are hungry, hungry beasts. And so the demand for images is higher than it has ever been, which is great for photographers. But at the same time, there's very, very little monetary value in those pictures. I would challenge you, though, to go look at the difference between people who are taking pictures with their smartphones in San Francisco right now of that red dawn, they're calling it, you know, mm -hmm. Blade Runner look, versus the photojournalists at the San Francisco Chronicle and the 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 you know, side by side comparisons. There's no comparison. The photojournalist pictures of that are just phenomenal. I mean, they are breathtaking. Because Scared. they know what to do with the they cameras. They know exactly like said. what they're doing with these cameras and they know how to compose a picture and they know where to go to be in the right place to take these pictures. I mean, it's just astounding what they're doing. So photojournalism does still matter. Um, thankfully we do have a, a really talented photojournalists out there, just not nearly as many as we had. Um, and, and I'm really glad to be able to see that we, we can see the professionals like Hillary Clinton today, or was Barack Obama or maybe both, but I know Barack Obama tweeted a set of pictures, uh, from San Francisco and they were all from professionals and they were just outstanding pictures. And, you know, you, you, they, they just can't be compared to the, just people walking around with their phones. Now it, it's interesting enough from the people with their phones because the subject matter is interesting. It's just crazy right now out there. Yeah. But the photographer, photojournalists, the trained photographers, man, they got it going. They know what they're doing. Yeah. Cause one thing I will, I will say like from taking that class last semester, I actually got to know a little bit more about my iPhone camera. Cause one of the reasons why I even got an iPhone to begin with was the camera itself. Like I had an Android as a mm -hmm. galaxy and all my friends used to get on me about having an Android camera. So once I got the iPhone, I was like, yeah, now my picture quality is better, but taking mm -hmm. your class, actually took my pictures to a whole nother level because now I don't take pictures vertically. I take it <laughs> horizontally. Like, and, and, Yeah, thank you. Especially and, video. Thank you. <laughs> it's, and it's way better. Like I didn't realize that until I, I took mm -hmm. your class. And it's like you said, it's about, it's not about what you have in your hand. It's about how you use it. Mm -hmm. So with the phone, like even though you don't have like a, the most expensive camera, like you can still get some great quality photos and video just by this. If you use the settings right and you like actually, know what to do with the camera itself. It's like when you showed us the movie, that was completely shot on an iPhone camera, which I didn't even know existed. Mm -hmm. And at first I didn't even realize it was shot with that camera until you said something. And then going back and looking at it, I was like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. now I can kind of tell. But it just goes to show the magic that it was able to do with the iPhone itself. Cause like I said, I didn't even know that it was shot with an iPhone itself. Right, and that's a really important point to make. And I'm glad you said that. And it's something I try to make is that you know, you don't want to know what kind of camera something was shot with. If you're, if you're, if your readers are focused on and thinking about, Oh, that's an iPhone or that's a mirrorless. If that's what they're talking about, then you failed because they're talking about the wrong things. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be talking about that crazy crap that's going on out there in San Francisco. That's nuts. Or, um, you know, those floods are just so devastating. I feel, feel for those people. Or, you know, maybe I have a better understanding about how votes are counted now. That's what you want them to be talking about, not what kind of camera you use. And so that's that to me what it boils down to. It just doesn't matter if it's a phone, if you can get the job done. Now, some things are really hard to do with the phone. You can't go shoot 
a traditional sporting event and get action shots with a phone. You can try and some people have and some people can get something, but you need longer, frankly, you just need longer lenses and faster motor drives. It's just a fact of life. Yeah, because zoom can only go so far. Yeah, yeah. You, I can't, mean, get, are, you can't get that close to one. Yeah, there are <laughs> limitations to these phones, but there is a lot of things you can do with these phones. If you, you know, just use your noodle and use your feet to get close and, um, you know, shoot things that are relevant and important. You can do it. Now, do you think also with the current evolution of like phones having better camera technology, do you think camera tech altogether has gotten way better over the years oh god yes camera tech so it's always evolving it's like every two years you gotta upgrade your camera that's crazy mm. i still have my first camera my first film cameras even really uh, they're probably yeah some of them are behind me in the cabinet back there uh, wow. i don't know if you can see them i'll lean back a little bit there's some back there back in there some of my old cameras and lenses are back there um and comparing those cameras to uh well comparing them even just to this it's really remarkable um the differences but now we're looking at like i had a um you know a mirrorless camera in class today and then we're gonna start talking about mirrorless cameras which are it's not super new technology but it's really building steam right now and, and it it really is going to be um, the future of dslrs is mirrorless um and those advances are just ridiculous um, how fast they are. And it's really hard to keep up, frankly. <laughs> it's hard for me to keep. I could keep up when I was doing it full time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had cameras in my hands every day and I knew what was coming. And, and, you know, and I knew that, you know, the next generation of the same camera that I had and I knew what the improvements were going to be and how to handle that. But now anymore, I just, it's just leapfrogging. It's happening so fast, especially with the mirrorless technology. I mean, I've, I've not used many of the mirrorless cameras myself, like full time clearly I know how to handle one, but there's some things and things about them that I don't, I still don't really understand. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the uh, Associated Press uh, just announced this past few months that they're switching their entire uh, professional photography staff over to Sony mirrorless cameras away from Canon. Really? Which is really saying something. That's a big statement right there. And one reason they're doing it, like the White House Press Corps is a good example is that if you've ever listened to a press conference at the White House, um, when you can hear the camera shutters firing and it just sounds like yeah. a helicopter's going off in the room. It's just so annoying uh, and a distraction. And with the Sony cameras, they're silent. You don't, you don't hear the shutters going off. Um, so that's one reason I think that they're doing that. The cameras are smaller and more compact and they're quieter, um, but their abilities, their capabilities are the same or better. Do you see cameras kind of like all cameras kind of going in a direction? Like where do you see the future of camera tech going? Uh, I think it just depends on what you're trying to do with it. I think that the, a big part of the future will be mirrorless because the mirrorless, like I said, they're smaller, they're more compact. Uh, the quality is as good or better and they can shoot stills or video. So that having those hybrid cameras are really helpful. Um, but you know, what cinema going to be doing cinema is not, you know, Hollywood filmmakers and they're not going to be using those necessarily. They might be using them as secondary cameras or something like that, but their primary cameras are Canons and Sony's and Ari's and these other really big things. Yeah. Have you been seeing them using, I know 4k is well, well I guess I could use past tense was the big thing. Cause now they're coming <laughs> out with stuff that's 8k. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> at I I'll, I'll be talking about it. Cause I used to work in the electronics department uh, at Costco, and I was just talking like I'll talk to some members, and I would say, if you don't have, well, if you want to get this 4K TV, you better make sure you're gonna have like some streaming services, cause cable uh, companies don't even have like 4K channels for the most part, and yeah. now there's 8K. Yeah. Like it's just I mean <laughs> I actually haven't seen an 8K camera, but I can only imagine like it's yeah. being huge and it i haven't even seen what anything looks like you know and i'm actually gonna get the new xbox one that's going to have 8k technology yeah. so hopefully i'll be i mean able to at what point is it like better than our eyeballs can even see i don't even know the answer to that i don't know it is so hard to keep up and the you know yeah. you get a better camera then you need a better monitor and a better tv and then you need a better camera and then you need a better monitor i feel like it's kind of a conspiracy amongst all these people to make us keep buying all this new stuff it's all about money. It yeah, is. Exactly. <laughs> but I'm telling you, I think four, I mean, I'm happy to see, you know, three or four years ago, 4K was just, 
kind of a fairly new and you didn't have mm -hmm. much function for it, but man, I sure love looking at 4K now. Um, what some people are doing interestingly with uh, 4K and even N8K and 6K is that they're shooting it at the highest resolution um, and they're actually able to kind of, um, they're, they're, they're cropping the image after the fact. Mm. Uh, so, you know, there are a lot of people that are doing interviews with an 8K camera uh, and they're only doing a, a one camera shoot on the interview, but then in the editing room, they can slice and dice it up and it looks like a three camera interview because they can yeah. crop it and they're not, used, they're not losing any resolution. As long as they're editing it like in 4K or 2K or something like that, uh -huh. you've got twice as many pixels as you need. So you could slice out half the picture and it still is 4K. Oh. Forever. So it's kind of an interesting thing to think about um, how people are doing that, Very the, way, the ways that they're using all those pixels. So... Oh. I know you got the chance to cover a, a lot of great things from covering local people in Kentucky, just doing their everyday thing to, like you said, covering Harrison Ford and Dalai Lama and many sports events. Is there anything that you wish you got the chance to cover or you would like to cover in the future? Um, that's interesting too. A lot of photographers and photojournalists kind of brag about like the Super Bowl and and, you know, NCAA Final Four championship games, things like that. I've covered, I'm sure, at least 20 Kentucky Derbies. Um, I don't really care to have gone. I've never been to a Super Bowl, and I don't care that I haven't gone to a Super Bowl. Um, I've been to my share of high school football games, and I like them just as well, and college football games. I used to cover UK for, of course, for the Herald Leader for years, and then I did. I covered UK for the Associated Press for a few years after that. Um I don't really care if I ever cover another one of those. I don't really miss them. I don't live for that. Um, oh man, I got to do one of the best ones I'll admit. And it was right after, right in my last year at the Herald Leader, I got to cover Barack Obama's first inauguration in DC. Mm, I remember man, that day. God, that was- As young as I am, I remember yeah, that day. I'll, I'll never forget that day. That was one of the best days ever, I think, in covering something. And the, the, the mood and tone and the vibes of that day I've never felt anything like it. I don't it was know. It's very cold that day too. I do it was cold. And I don't know if I'll ever feel anything like it again in terms of the vibes, but it was just such a great feeling. My position that day was at the top of the Washington monument. Mm. So uh, I got to, I got to, I never actually, I didn't get to hear his speech or see it necessarily because I was up in the top of this tiny little room in the top of the monument. And we had to shoot through like this six inch plexiglass stuff. It was horrible. Um, but it was cool to be up there because I had a vantage point that only like six other photographers had. And, you know, when the, um, interesting, when the, uh, when Trump was talking about the crowd size and they started publishing all these pictures of Obama's inauguration and Trump's inauguration, they were showing the mall. And a lot of those pictures were from up uh, at the top of the Washington Monument. And a lot of those pictures were my pictures from Obama. Right. They were comparing Trump's size to, so that was kind of fun. <laughs> um, but to get back to your question, the things that I wish I had done, um, or that you would like to cover in the fight. Like hmm. Uh, I would like to, I, so I've, I've, I've gotten more of an interest in film since, you know, my degree. Um, I would think I would be, I'm more interested in doing some film work and being a cinematographer. Um, I'd like to try my hand at that. I think I would also enjoy doing some of the behind the scenes still photography on a movie set. I think that would be a lot of fun. I'm, I'm fascinated to see how movies are made and how cinematographers are lighting things. I mean, it's ridiculous to see how these cinematographers are lighting things. And I think that all photographers, still photographers could learn a thing or two from cinematographers and film work. Um, so I've kind of felt, I, I like behind the scenes stuff and documentary style stuff. I would like to do um, more projects in Appalachia if I had time. Um, my, both my parents um, um, did a lot of their work in Appalachia studies and, and volunteer work outreach in Appalachia. And I would still like to be part of that in some way if I could in the future. But not, I can't think of a specific uh, event like the Super Bowl or something. I don't, I don't really care about those big things anymore. It, early on, it was kind of fun. But man, you do, you do 20 Kentucky Derbies and it's old. You yes. do five Kentucky Derbies and it's old. I mean. The same old thing. Yeah. I don't want to do NASCAR. I've done smaller NASCAR. I've done NASCAR races and I don't want to do NASCAR races. I mean, I just don't care about that stuff. So I like the smaller. I would go to the dirt track in Junction City and that's my kind of day. 
Mm. That's what I want to do is give me the dirt track in Junction City, Kentucky, and I'll go there every weekend and have a good old time because it's just real people, smaller. I got better access, and it's just better. So you appreciate, from, from the sound of it, you appreciate more of – smaller more real settings than like the grandiose big stage type of settings yeah i do i think it's a very good way to put it community journalism that's what i would rather do i don't need to be on the big stage and see the big stuff because that i mean there's plenty of other people to do that Mm. um and you're also not getting very unique pictures from those it's very difficult to get unique pictures from those because everybody's shooting about the same thing um so I would rather just kind of go off and be on my own and cover some things that nobody else is covering that needs to be covered. You know, there, again, there's just a real shortage of community photojournalists right now. And uh, I would rather um, try to fill that gap than to be yet one more photographer at the Super Bowl. Yeah. So I want to go ahead and transition this from photojournalism and photography to another passion of yours. <laughs> Pigeons. <laughs> so I understand that you have a pigeon farm and you also have a business selling supplement supplements for pigeons. So yeah. talk to me. Where, where did this love for pigeons come from? Well, let's go full circle back to the beginning of this conversation. Remember I told you when I was a kid, I was walk, going around my neighborhood taking pictures of this, that, and the other. Mm-hmm. And I'll never forget um, discovering a dove's nest, a morning dove's nest in, in the hawthorn tree in our front yard. And I climbed that tree, thorns and all, to try to get as close as I could to this dove and doves are notorious for not leaving their nest. And so I could get as close as I wanted that thing. And, and to, I took pictures of these, this dove with my little camera. Um, and that really, I think, um, started the, the, my love of birds and wildlife. And when I was a kid, I, I found a neighbor who had domesticated doves. And so I bought a couple of pairs from him and I had them in my backyard. And then I discovered homing pigeons. Somebody else in, in Lexington had homing pigeons and I got a couple from him moved to Berea and I still, I built myself a loft in Berea at our home and had doves and pigeons there. And then when I, uh, and that, that played a role in considering um, going into ornithology for college because I still had those doves and pigeons in my backyard. And it was really just for fun. Um, so, it, but I had to give them up going to school and in my early career. So it was really about 10 or 15 years ago that I was able to get back into them, them again when I had a yard that was appropriate to have a pigeon loft. So I started, uh, started with homing pigeons, started with racing pigeons as opposed to doves this time. And, um, and so I'm, you know, a member of the local racing pigeon club and that, that's what we do. We, we raise racing pigeons and then we race those pigeons. It's a one way race. Uh, so they come home from a liberation point. We drive them hundreds of miles away. We let them go as a group. And they come home to their individual lofts and whoever flew the fastest wins the race. Um, and it's an old sport. Um, originated, I didn't know that existed. Yeah, that originated in Belgium and it's a sport that is worldwide. I mean, it's huge uh, in uh, China right now. It's going gangbusters in China. Um, it's dwindling in the States. Not so many people doing it anymore. Um, but that's what I do. I mean, I have a pigeon loft in my backyard every twice a day. I'm back there, uh, feeding and watering the birds. And, um, there's so many fun things. Uh, and I, and I continue to take pictures of the birds too. I have, um, a calendar. So <laughs> when I got the birds, I was always taking pictures of my pigeons. And then I decided to make a account. Cal- well, actually some people on social media were stealing my pictures. Um, really? it was driving me, driving me crazy. Well, yeah, people do. They just like, Oh, they do it all the time. Yeah, they just take pictures, take pictures and they publish it. And I'm like, Hey God, you know, you need to stop that. These are my pictures. Stop doing that. And then, so I thought, well, you know what? I'm just going to sell these pictures and try to make money and it'll help me pay bird feed. And you know, I, I'm always buying birds too. Pigeons just can be expensive. And so I'm you know, always looking to buy a new pigeon. So I need some <laughs> money to do that. Uh, so I made a calendar one year and, um, sold a few hundred copies, 500 copies of this calendar. Uh, I thought, oh, that's cool. I made some money doing that. Um, did it again the next year, made all my money back, you know, sold another four or 500 copies. Um, and, uh, then, you know, there's a, I discovered, I had a friend that works at Alltech. Alltech is a, um, animal nutrition company that's here in, in Lexington. Well, it's in Jessamy County and they sell, uh, ingredients for, for, you know, health and nutrition for, for livestock including poultry. And so I got with them. Um, I'm trying to make this a short story. I got with them and they essentially uh, helped me develop some products that I could use on my birds. 
Um, and so these are just, these are natural supplements um, that help the birds be healthy. They're like probiotics kind of things. And my friends started using them and then I basically started slapping labels on them and created a company. And I used the money that I'd earned from the calendar um, and the network and, and, and the email list and all those kinds of things. And I used that to uh, start the business. Um, so I have, you know, I have a pretty big social media following on Instagram and Facebook. I've got about, oh, I think it's, I think I'm at maybe 15,000 on Facebook and 14,000 on Instagram. And I've got an email list of you pop it, uh, huh? 4,000 on an email <laughs> list. And so, I, you know, I got into the, basically did the digital marketing business, which of course came very natural to me because I'm a communicator. I'm a visual communicator. I mean, I can take pictures better than anybody in the pigeon market. I promise. You know, ain't nobody gonna take better 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 pigeon pictures than me in America. <laughs> Are you competitive about that too? Uh, maybe a little bit. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Uh, so yeah, so there's the competitive part too. I like to compete with the pigeons, but but I, I, I the, the pigeon businesses, domesticated pigeon businesses in America are very old school and you know kind of tired, and they're not particularly good at digital not good at publishing, you know, and their marketing is uh, whatever. And the pictures are horrible. And so I'm like, I'm going to, I got to take it up a notch with these guys. And so, you know, and it works. I mean, I've got a big social media presence uh, amongst, you know, pigeon racers in America and overseas. I mean, we have customers in 13 countries. I just got it. I just got an email like this week from a guy in um, some islands I've never even heard of. I had to look it up and they're off the coast of New Zealand somewhere. Solomon Islands, never heard of them. I got yes. a globe right here. I'm yeah, ready. Solomon Islands. They're like north of New Zealand and off the northeast coast of Australia. And uh, he's like, hey, man, I want to be a wholesaler of your products. I'm like, oh, okay, let's go. You know, I got wholesalers in Philippines and uh, I got customers in the Middle East and Europe and Mexico, Canada, uh, South Africa, Australia. I mean, it's been, it's been, a, it's been a hoot. Um, so it, it's, it's a good little side hustle. It's not a quit your job side hustle necessarily, but, <laughs> but it's, it's a good, good one. And that's the other thing I've learned. I learned in the last 10 years when we had the great recession, you know, I, I, um, I want to say that, you know, I'm teaching now clearly and I'm not a full-time photojournalist. I'm not at the Herald leader anymore. The Herald leader was my dream job. Um, and I was very, very fortunate. To, to land that job in, the, in a city and a state that I love. I mean, that's everybody's dream as a journalist, I think, to be able to work in an area that you care about. Mm. I would have retired from that job had the economy let me. I would have. I, I didn't want to leave that job, but the writing was on the wall and uh, I had an opportunity at UK and I took it. And I, and I, don't re I don't regret it. I will say I miss it. Yeah, clearly I miss it, but I don't regret it. Um, but I also learned that, you know, economies can be fragile and I've tried to diversify myself too. So um, I have a diverse income stream now. I have a teaching income stream. I have a freelance uh, commercial editorial freelance stream from photography and video work. And then the, the pigeon supplement company is also a diverse income stream. So um, that's something else I've learned in the past was to, you know, I can't, I can't rely on one company, one. one job anymore. That's yeah. kind of sad. But that's that's the reality of it now. And I think even, I mean, like the way our economy is now, obviously not the same as the Great Recession was. But I think even in this time for our uh, economic status, it's taught a lot of people to do what you said, is to have multiple streams of income. Because yeah. with a lot of people losing their jobs as they did uh, since the pandemic started, a lot of people started picking up different types of side hustles. You started seeing more people doing podcasts. You started seeing people right. starting to pick up gigs, doing multiple different things. And it could be of their passion, like where yours was to take pictures of pigeons and like just study birds. You actually find a way to monetize that and still yeah. have fun and enjoy at yeah. the same time. So I think yeah. in this time that we in, I think people have to find a way to do that as well and create multiple streams of income. Mm. Yeah, and there's a, there's a philosophy of thought out there that you that you should. Um, what's it called? Like find your one thing or something. Have you heard that? I, it's you know, it's like find your niche and stick yeah. to it or something like that yeah or? it's like find your passion and do it and like don't let anything stop you and you know that should be your career and i don't quite believe that i think that it's partially true but i think also mm. if you if you feel like and i've been lucky that i have i did that with photography um but i also think that if you force it um you may also end up hating it um 
You know, mm-hmm. if, if you, if your passion is, if it's impossible to monetize your passion and you just spend all of your time trying to make that happen, you could end up hating it and failing. And you don't want to, so you don't want to ruin your passion either if it's not practical. So I would tell people to just tread, tread cautiously. And hopefully if you can, if you can get it right and make it work, then you're, you're in a good place. But yeah, sometimes, I sometimes, as, go ahead. I was going to say, I think that's a good point you brought up because like I always teach people to follow their, their dreams. Like what I'm doing right here, this is something that I always mm-hmm. thought about doing since I was a kid. And what you say is very true. Like, don't follow it too much, especially if you can't make uh, money off of it. Like, cause you'll get burnt out and you get, and you end up hating it. And even if you can make money off, I, I've seen cases where people go into their dream jobs and they do it so much. Yeah. It's not even, like I said, it's not even the money part. It's the fact they do it so much and they get burnt out from get it. Burnt. And they just yeah. don't even love it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. I mean, and I, and I do think people should follow their dreams and they should see what they can do and they should try to make a go of it. Um, but they also have their eyes open about it and, you know, make sure that they don't, they don't kill themselves and ruin it either. And maybe, maybe these days it's two or three things and maybe you do change career eventually. Look, I've, I've changed careers now and I, man, I found a new passion. I love teaching now. I wasn't hit with, I never saw myself as a professor at the university of Kentucky. If you'd asked me this 15 years ago, I'd have laughed at you. I said, you're crazy. I, <laughs> professor, I don't have what it takes to be. I don't know how to be a professor. I don't have what it takes. And at UK, I can't get in there. But, you know, my, here I am, you know, and I love it. And I have a new career, and um, I love every day of it. And it's fantastic. I'm really glad that I can help people like you. I hope I am a little bit anyway. But other students, you if I can guide you a little bit and help you get where you want to go, I'm happy to do that. That's great. Uh, David, I'd like to thank you for joining me today on How You Doing. We had a wonderful discussion. Uh, I know <laughs> I know you joked about being on here and finally getting a chance. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm telling you, man, I always thought about it. I just had to execute it. And I appreciate you for coming on and giving this time and sharing with us about your career and a multitude of things, including your love for pigeons and your business <laughs> and where we see photojournalism and photo and photo. Yeah, photography going in the future so thank you dan yeah. well, you're very welcome kendall i appreciate the invitation and uh you can check me out on uh, at the pigeon photographer on instagram or castle go ahead P- tag yourself yeah castle, castle pigeon with a k i live on castle road so we named it castle loft and castle pigeon so castle loft has got its own website if you want to see my birds my breeding breeding birds and uh castle pigeon is the name of our company for supplements and the pigeon photographer is on instagram you so. just, or you can just type in your name because I typed in your name on Google and the website popped up and everything. Yeah, Location. I, you know, I work hard at that SEO, man. <laughs> that, that SEO means something. You got it right. I was, I was like, hold on. What, why is there a location over here? What, what website? <laughs> so go ahead. Y'all heard them here, folks. Uh, y'all heard it here for the forget about it. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, <laughs> all right, Kendall. Um, all right. Thank you, David. You have a great weekend. I'll see you soon. All righty. Thank you all for joining us. It's been an episode. How you doing? Peace out.